series, I'm tracing the footsteps of two of the most important people in the history of the world's favourite board game, Monopoly. In 1935, Victor Watson, managing director of John Waddington's in Leeds, took the train down to London and with the help of his secretary Marjorie Phillips, set out to choose the streets and sites that would make up the Monopoly board. In truth, those footsteps are sometimes a little difficult to make out. I'm starting off today with the oranges and there's no sign of a Marlborough Street in the A to Z or my 1930s post office directory. And I've never encountered Vine Street anywhere except on the Monopoly board. But Bow Street is the first stop, and at least I know where that is. Ask a Monopoly player for his favourite set, and he'll say, well, the Mayfair one. Ask a serious Monopoly player, and he'll say, get your hands off my title deeds. If forced, he may concede that it's the orange set, but he'll never tell you why. So I will. Or at least the man I'm about to meet will. Hi, Chris. Hi. Nice to meet you. How's it going? Can you just show me all your fantastic, exciting statistical analyses of Monopoly? Yes, I'll be uh, right, pleased to do that. Chris Ray is an analyst at an investment bank, and he's created a simulation of a 1,000 turn Monopoly game that reveals which is the best set to have. Chris's computer model predicts that with hotels here on Bow Street and its orange neighbours, the set will bag you £24,619 in the course of a game almost twice what you'd get with a fully loaded dark blues. The reason is that more people land on the oranges than on any other set. And that's because there are so many ways of being sent to jail. Absolutely. So if you're there and, you, and your computer model rolls the dice again, you, you, rolls the dice up, again from uh, yes. you end up on the orange set, which is where we are now. As you know, I mean, you're going to roll, yes, six out of jail, so uh, you're going to end up smacking the smack in the middle of the oranges. Yes. Back to Bow Street. Following the now familiar pattern, it was knocked up in the mid-17th century for the rich and famous. The woodcarver Grinling Gibbons lived here. But by the 1740s, eight pubs were somehow squeezed into this short street, along with a cluster of notorious brothels. Number two was the home of Edmund Curl, fondly referred to as the father of English pornographic literature. Something clearly had to be done about Bow Street, and in the early 1750s, the remarkable Henry Fielding, comic novelist and crime-fighting pioneer did it by founding the celebrated Bow Street Runners. No one seems quite certain why they were called that, but it's my guess that as there were just half a dozen of the poor chaps to begin with, policing London on foot would have required a Benny Hill turn of speed at the very least. With a police station and a magistrate's court, Bow Street clearly wasn't taking any chances. The court is still processing West End felons, but the cop shop has closed. The usual police business anyway. When Vic and Marge came this way, the street would still have been part of Covent Garden Market. The foreign fruit stalls opened directly onto Bow Street, and people would still come to gawp, as Charles Dickens had, at the pineapples. All that's left of the old days is this terrific end flank of the fruit market itself, now incorporated into the Opera House extension. Now Marlborough Street. There are more than 50 entries under Marlborough in the A to Z, but only one of them is a street, and that's little more than an alleyway well outside our patch. It's my hunch that Vic and Marge actually went for Great Marlborough Street, and that's just the other side of Soho. The street was once London's Tin Pan Alley, but aside from the headquarters of Sony Music Entertainment, the only reminder of those days is this record dealer. 25 LPs for a tenner out on the pavement, but downstairs in the collector section, it's a very different story. Otto Klemper Alive, £600. Beethoven's Violin Concert. 175. Villa Lobos, Forest of the Amazon. Yours for 180 pounds. Ah, if only I had the money. And a record player. One constant since the 30s is the Liberty Building. One, two, three, four. And why I'm pacing out its frontage, I'll explain later. Seeking to expand his Oriental Goods Emporium on Regent Street in the early years of the last century, Arthur Liberty was frustrated by a conservative landlord who routinely vetoed any architectural flamboyance. 
Because this landlord was the King of England, there wasn't much Arthur could do. Instead, he brought up properties behind his store in a street where he could build what he liked. In 1925, he replaced these with an edifice as stately yet unhinged as George III tucking into a tasty hearthrug and linked it to the Regent Street original by a third floor bridge. Arthur Liberty was clearly a man of singular tastes, but to explain just how singular, I'll have to briefly take you away from Great Marlborough Street. His Majesty's ship Hindustan, with its 80 guns, was launched in 1841 and served for 80 years before ending up at a breaker's yard in South London. HMS Impregnable, 121 guns and the Navy's last wooden ship, set sail on her maiden voyage two decades after Hindustan, but retired in the same year, 1921, when she was sold off to Castle's shipyard in Woolwich. 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58. Now come inside Liberties, where along with the £500 scarves and £2,000 handbags you can't help noticing, well shiver my timbers, rather a lot of clearly recycled wood. Could these well-heeled shoppers, happily unaware of the telltale evidence of dockyard joinery around them, ever suspect that this place was once afloat? 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98. 98! Exactly the length of the impregnable, with the store's depth the same as Hindustan and impregnable combined. Anyone confused as to why a 1920s building in the form of a Stratford-upon-Avon cottage should have a galleon as its weather vane need wonder no more. Great Marlborough Street's other notable landmark is its Magistrates Court, or was. Today, in authentic Monopoly fashion, it's being transformed into a hotel. It was here that Gladstone gave evidence against a man who had attempted to blackmail him after seeing the then-Chancellor talking to a prostitute near Leicester Square. Here too, that Oscar Wilde appeared as defendant in the libel case that was to prove his undoing. From its beginning, the court had acquired a salacious celebrity of its own. Continuing this tradition, and perhaps influenced by its proximity to the heart of swinging London, I'm standing at the top of Carnaby Street here, it was at Marlborough Street Magistrates Court that the establishment chose to take on the bad boys of rock and roll. Mick Jagger, Brian Jones, John Lennon, all made unwanted appearances. Now the last of the oranges, Vine Street. There are three in central London, but only one in the West End. It's a stone's throw from Piccadilly Circus, but blink and you'll miss it. It's just down a man in moon passage. So stunted is Vine Street that the A to Z cartographers can't even squeeze in its full name, all six characters, on their street atlas. The grubby backside of the Meridian Hotel, a wine bar that my directory tells me was once the man in the moon pub, there's nothing here to justify its inclusion on the board. So why Vine Street, instead of the blatantly more significant addresses around? Was Tottenham Court Road rejected after a bellboy at heels laughed at Victor's spats? Did Marjorie shrewdly calculate that substituting Vine Street for Upper Burlington Gardens would save £59, 4 shillings and threepence a year on ink? Who can say? I thought Vine Street meant nothing to me, but I was wrong. I didn't remember its name, but I've been here, in that building and I now know what connects the oranges, or at least what used to. Not that many years ago, I remember escorting a distressed pickpocketing victim from Piccadilly Circus to Vine Street Police Station. So that's the link, the law. Like Marlborough Street's courtroom, Vine Street Police Station is today defunct. The orange set's law link might now have been broken, but the 21st century has happily provided another. Alone amongst the monopoly groups, its three streets couldn't muster a single McDonald's between them. Time for some lunch and a hollow Londoner's laugh as I contemplate the next square along the board. Free parking. Free parking was always an enigma. Relevant perhaps to those of us who lapped the board by racing car, its existence was an affront to players booting it down Bond Street or ironing up to the Angel. And when you landed there, nothing happened. It was the only completely impotent square on the board. So why was it there at all? Waddington's had only the Empire and European rights. The original monopoly was American, and so was Henry Ford. In 1921, when only one in 168 Britons had a car, the transatlantic figure was already one in 14. The free parking square acknowledged the fact that American cities were designed around cars, in a way that London, so patently, was not.
That wasn't to say that downtown parking stateside was always straightforward. This is the first vertical automatic parking machine in commercial operation. It is installed in the heart of Chicago's busy loop district. The capacity of this machine is 48 cars. British inventors were looking at other solutions. The crab car has arrived. The car that can be driven sideways as well as on the wrong side of the road. The secret is a jack wheel device which raises the tires from the ground and then moves the car sideways. When the city and suburban electric carriage company opened a seven-storey car park just behind Piccadilly, London's age of free parking ended almost before it had begun. So inaugurating a hundred-year quest for that secret place round the back of D.H. Evans where the wardens ran out of yellow paint. But free parking does exist. The trick isn't where you park, but what you park. In the borough of Westminster, home to almost all the Monopoly addresses, you can park for free if you've got one of these. And as the owner of an electrically powered vehicle, you don't have to pay the congestion charge either. So that'll be all right there for the next four hours. Now let's off up the Strand. Let's all go down the Strand. The Strand's golden age was the Edwardian, when as London's good time promenade, it boasted restaurants, hotels, pubs, and more theatres than any other street in the capital. This street, more than most, has upheld its traditions. Of its 1930s commercial themes, only the fated trinity of pawnbroking, dentistry and the manufacture of surgical instruments have been swept aside. There were six Lions Corner houses along the Strand, and half are still restaurants. The Adelphi Theatre remains, and these two characters have been welcoming customers since 1706 and flying the flag for the dozen or so stamp dealers resident in the 30s, Stanley Gibbons. And then there's Bush House, since 1940 home to the BBC's World Service, or Empire Service as it then was, and an English retriever. Black Jack, the watchdog of Bush House. Black Jack states he is not an actor and does no tricks. He is an English retriever who early in life decided to try his luck in London. So he applied for and got the job of watchdog here, his application stating that he was young, strong, willing to learn, and had no bad habits. If Bush House had its Black Jack, then just across the road, one of the world's most famous hotels had its Black Cat. So what's the story behind, uh, behind Casper here? It's his job to be the 14th guest whenever there are only 13 people for dinner. There is a kind of superstition that if you have a table with only 13 people at it, the first person to get up from table will be the first person to die. It's <laughs> incredibly dramatic. The legend goes back at the Savoy to 1898, when apparently there was a dinner party at the Savoy hosted by a very wealthy South African called Wolf Joel. And at the last minute, one of his guests dropped out, so there were only 13 for dinner. And although they mentioned the superstition, he just laughed that off and he said it was a ridiculous idea. And he quite happily was the first person to get up from table. And he then went back to, I think, Johannesburg, where he was shot and killed two weeks later. So after that, they decided they really had to do something to prevent any more fatalities of this kind. When it opened in 1889, the Savoy was the grandest of the Strand's hotels. But seven years later, a rival stole that crown. With 600 rooms, the Cecil was Europe's largest and most magnificent hotel. Perhaps a little too magnificent, as just before completion, its bankrupted proprietor was sentenced to 14 years in prison. The Cecil never fully recovered and was soon demolished. In its place arose Shell Mech's house, much to the approval of 1930s architectural historian Harold Clun, a man whose uncompromising vision of the capital's future had no place for its past. Trying to pinpoint exactly what it was that he despised about London's higgledy-piggledy old frontages and what he loved about their uniform monolithic replacements, Harold Clun concluded that the new buildings in the Strand made the old ones look as though they wanted a shave. Regrettably, someone passed the razor to Sweeney Todd. Which takes us very neatly onto Fleet Street. At the beginning of the 20th century, there really was a haircutting establishment called Sweeney Todd's here at number 153. I'm sure most of us are familiar with the demon barber who gave the Flying Squad its rhyming slang nickname. The only hairdresser for whom head and shoulders was a pie filling. The only businessman to appreciate the full scope of the phrase tough customer. Fleet Street had more than its share of barbers. 
One set up shop in Henry VIII's old gaff. Brave was the client there who asked for plenty off the top. No one's quite sure when the first barber stuck up his pole outside this perfect half-timbered edifice, but there was certainly one here from Victorian times, right up to the 1930s. When Prince Henry's Palace was built, Fleet Street had already been around for some time, making it the oldest on the board. One of its earliest recorded appearances was in 1339, when a resident was charged with harbouring prostitutes and sodomites. But then this was the course of the dependably disgusting River Fleet, channelled underground in 1766. It's still down there now, as a sewer. The river's disappearance did for many of Fleet Street's traditional industries, notably the tanning of animal hides, but one in particular survived, printing. By the end of the 17th century, dozens of typesetters and bookbinders had set up shop, and in the early 18th, Fleet Street's first newspaper, The Daily Current, opened its offices here. Two was company when the morning advertiser set up over the road, and a century on, the crowd was almost out of control. There were dozens, maybe hundreds, of publications listed under Fleet Street in my directory. Gas World, the Sierra Leone Weekly News, the Malayan Medical Journal, the Quaker Opticians Quarterly. You couldn't make it up, although in the case of that last one, I'm afraid I just did. By the 1930s, almost every home in Britain took a daily paper, and half of them an evening one too. The era spawned circulation wars and witnessed the birth of silly season stories. In 1933, a daft obsession with the Loch Ness Monster dominated the pages of those papers which chose to overlook the election as German Chancellor of some Hitler chappy. Fleet Street sourced its first stories in the pokey inns and coffee shops where Dr Johnson had held court. Later, the street's seven pubs and bars became its newsrooms, and until a couple of decades ago, still were. I'm meeting Sir Peregrine Worsthorne, former editor of the Sunday Telegraph, at one of the most famous. We did spend a disgraceful looking back on it, amount of time in El Vinezo in the Fleet Street clubs, talking, uh, having, having uh, a marvellously uh, lively time socially. Well, I think, I think you're doing yourself a slight disservice then. I mean, I'd have spent a few hours in El Vino's. My grandfather worked in the Telegraph and he would often, you know, be there until midnight. Well, if he told you that, if he told you that, or told your mother that, uh, I think this was about as accurate as most journalistic stories ever are, because I don't recall working very hard ever in my journalistic life. There were moments, were moments of, of, of tremendous uh, intensity to work covering a story and I mean of course we got home late but the idea that this was because we were overworking is something which I'm surprised you as a grandson of a journalist have been encouraged to believe. <laughs> the days of the long lunch at El Vino's were numbered when digital technology began to replace hot metal typesetting. Throughout the 1980s Fleet Street fragmented and dispersed. The cat's friend and the shoe and leather record might already have moved out but when the last Fleet Street issue of the Sunday Express was loaded onto vans here in 1989, an era officially came to an end. With medieval Fleet Street, one of the oldest sites on the board, the last of the Reds is one of the newest. In its short life, Trafalgar Square has become the embodiment of London's civic dithering. Until 1829, this was the site of the Royal Stables, demolished in that year as part of the Charing Cross Improvement Scheme. The authorities first couldn't agree on a name for the planned new square, and once they decided to name-check the nation's most fated naval victory, they argued about how to honour the admiral who won it. The competition for a Nelson monument wasn't even held for another ten years, and the entries were all so poor they had to hold a second. Of the several column suggestions, the largest was a 218-foot cast-iron colossus, and though most stuck Horatio on the top, one James Hakewell put him at the bottom explaining that it was improper for a mere subject, however heroic, to look down on royalty. Finally, 14 years after the space for it was cleared, and 38 after he died at Trafalgar, the 17-foot image of Nelson was bolted to the top of 145 feet of fluted granite. Around its base are bronze depictions of his victories, cheekily cast from melted-down French cannons captured therein. All this was before anyone had even thought about how to fill the rest of the square. Some wanted a Colosseum, others a new Royal Academy. 
Even after they'd agreed on the fountains, it took a further two years to complete them, and when the water was turned on, they leaked. It would be another quarter of a century, long enough to become a staple London joke, before the famous lions were put in place, six times over budget, and an additional 58 years until the square was properly paved. Nothing, however, encapsulates Trafalgar Square's sloth-like development more effectively than the saga of its corner statues. Generals Napier and Havelock commandeered the southern corners in a whippet-like eight years, but the northeastern statue, George IV on horseback, was intended for Marble Arch, and erected at Trafalgar Square only as a stopgap. Most notoriously, the debate over what to put on the northwest plinth has rumbled on for more than 150 years. It still hasn't been settled. With Nelson's column like a giant exclamation mark saying you are here, Trafalgar Square has to be the city's hub, and for that reason this is where Londoners have gathered to celebrate, or protest. And the bomb demonstrators mobilised in force in Trafalgar Square. To make sure they didn't march to Parliament Square, the 4,000 police were drafted to the area. Throughout the 50s it was regularly thronged by campaigners for nuclear disarmament. In Vic and Marge's time, anti-appeasement protesters had filled the square. The 1990 poll tax riot was to kick off here, the catalyst for yet more draconian public order regulations. There are 56 clauses here, and the message is clear. No more fun of any kind. You can't lie down here, or even look as if you might be about to. You can't land a helicopter, which is fair enough, or carry a kite, which isn't. You cannot even, unless acting in accordance with permission given in writing by the Mayor, use any apparatus for the transmission, reception, reproduction or amplification of sound, speech or images. Enter Trafalgar Square with an Instamatic or a Walkman, in other words, and without Ken Livingstone's signed permission, you're in contravention of the Greater London Authority Act. Well, read it and weep, Heritage Wardens. We've got ours. <laughs> That's it for today. Next time we're hitting the night spots. That's the Yellows, Leicester Square, Coventry Street and Piccadilly. Do Not Pass Go returns next week at the earlier time of 8 o'clock. If you'd like to know more about Tim and his travels, go to our website, itv.com slash London. Mm -hmm.